Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Perspective on the Rise of Dictators with Kenneth C. Davis. I'm Alison Carvalho, the events manager for Barbara's Bookstores. Barbara's is a Chicago institution since 1963, and we are incredibly excited to be bringing you this wonderful event today. We are a family-owned and operated bookstore, and we pride ourselves on being able to create community spaces within our stores as well as out of them like these virtual events. Before we begin our discussion, I wanna give you a quick tour of Crowdcast for those of you who maybe haven't used it before. First off, we are still relatively new to these events. We started doing them back in June, but we're still figuring things out. So if we happen to have any technical difficulties, please be patient with us. We're gonna get things back up and running as quickly as we possibly can. Please make sure to chat with other fellow book lovers in the chat on the side. Um, we'll also be providing information on events or resources, so please keep an eye out there as well. If you happen to notice your video is experiencing any lag, please make sure to click on the gear button that should be on the bottom right hand corner of your screen and you'll be able to change your HD setting to 360. That tends to help with any lag that you might be experiencing. The last 10 to 15 minutes of the event will be open for questions. So if you have any questions, please make sure to put them in the ask a question function, which should be at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you'll be able to see a little box. You'll be able to type in a question and send it. And then other people can upvote your question, which moves it higher up in the queue. It's a great way to engage and ask questions with us. And it makes it easy for us to find them versus searching in the chat. And of course, one of the biggest, most important things is you want to make sure that you get a hold of this incredible book. So please make sure to click on the green button at the bottom of your screen that says you can buy Strongman here. And if you'd like to get it today, you can use our events discount code to get 10% off. So if you type in events at checkout, you'll be able to get 10% off on this incredible book. I think that might be everything. Oh, also, please make sure as we are engaging in these conversations, please make sure to be as respectful as possible to your fellow book lovers as we are going through the event. Now that is definitely everything. All right, we're gonna go ahead and bring our author to the screen. Today's author is best known for his New York Times bestselling books, America's Hidden History and the Don't Know Much About book series. He is also the author of In the Shadow of Liberty, The Hidden History of Slavery, More Deadly Than War, The Hidden History of the Spanish Flu, and The First World War, as well as many others. His writing has appeared in many publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Smithsonian Magazine. He enjoys making virtual events to schools, libraries, and bookstores, and historical societies, and speaks frequently about the importance of civic engagement and social studies education to protect democracy. I am excited to bring to the screen Kenneth C. Davis. Hello, how's it going? Hello, Allison. It is a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Chicago. I wish I were there in person. I love Chicago. And I say that as a New Yorker. Um, we're, you know, <laughs> we can be a little snobby, but I, I really am very fond of Chicago. I've been there many times. Uh, the Pritzker Museum, uh, I've visited a number of times in recent years to talk about my books, and um, it's, a, it's a great city, and I'm sorry we can't all enjoy each other's cities right now, but um, this too shall pass away, I believe. Exactly. At the very and the nice thing is, I do get to see you here today, even though it's not quite the way we want it to be, I do get to see you, which is very exciting. And the great thing is that we can still have a conversation about books, and that's what we like to, what I like to do. Um, I've been doing this for a very long time, and for me, books are not me giving a lecture. And we we talked about this off air before. This is not a lecture tonight. This is a, really a conversation. And I'll be very very eager to hear the voices and the questions and the concerns and the comments of, of the people who are joining us tonight. Um, for those who may not know me, uh, most people know don't know my name, but they might know this book. Don't know much about history, everything you need to know about American history but never learned. Came out 30 years ago. This is the new 30th anniversary edition. It is really hard for me to believe it when I say that to you, that this book is 30 years old. Obviously written when I was a very small child, but um, uh, the book is a collection of questions and answers about American history specifically, 
and it asks some very basic questions like, did Columbus really discover America or uh, what does the Declaration of Independence declare? I, I do that and did that because I've always been a curious person. I always like to ask questions and try and get answers and then make the answers available to people in uh, an easy, accessible, and conversational way. So that's kind of been the approach that I've taken to talking about history. But more important than just giving people information, even if it's accessible, is really trying to make the connection between the past and the present. And that's why we study history in the first place. It is not a collection of dates and battles and speeches, as many people think it is. They say to me, it's so boring. They just gave us all those dates. History is not about dates and battles and speeches. It's about real people doing real things. I was very lucky to learn that as a small child. My parents' idea of summer vacation very often was to take us, throw us in the back of the car with some old army surplus tents and sleeping bags. My father was a veteran of World War II. And we'd go to places like Gettysburg and Valley Forge or Fort Ticonderoga in upstate New York. And I always had the sense going to these places from a very young age, that history is something that happens in real places. It's not just the books on the shelf. And goodness knows I have plenty of books on my shelf and I've written <laughs> plenty of books. But this is what I've tried to do is really make history human, connect the past to the present so that we understand that what we are living through today is the result of everything that's happened before us. And we can learn from history. We should learn from history. We must learn from history. Um, a very good example of that very, very quickly is my previous book was called More Deadly Than War, The Hidden History of the Spanish Flu and the First World War. And it came out two years ago to mark the 100th anniversary of the Spanish flu. I thought it was a significant and the end of World War I. And of course, a lot of people asked me when it came out, but can such a thing happen again, the most deadly pandemic in American history? And I said, of course it, it can happen again. It's really not a question of if, it's a question of when. And of course, two years later, we are living through this and we should have learned a lot of lessons from 1918 to apply today. So that's why I think it's so important to understand the past and understand the connections to the present. And that's essentially why I wrote this book as well. This is a book that asks questions about history again, uh, questions that are very significant in our own time. How does a country follow the path of a dictator, a strong man, who is going to take it down a, such a dangerous and deadly path? Um, what makes a country go along with such a murderous leader? Um, and more importantly, especially right now in this country, um, how do we protect democracy when it is under attack, under threat uh, around the world and to a degree in the United States? So these are very important questions for our time that I think we can look back at the past and gain something from that knowledge. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's that to me is what I really connected with with this book is kind of seeing that kind of mirror image of what we've seen before and what we're seeing right now and kind of being able to contextual contextualize what we are experiencing now through looking at what we've been through for sure yeah i i wanted to just say one other thing before we get into the real nitty-gritty and nuts and bolts of the book is that uh, a lot of people first of all i should i should mention when we're talking about these strong men that the men we're talking about are names we all know or have at least heard if we don't know about them all. Mussolini of Italy, Adolf Hitler of Germany, of course, Saddam Hussein of Iraq, I'm sorry, I put he's last, but I, I mentioned him first, Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union, and Chairman Mao Zedong of, uh, of China. These were men who all combined together are responsible for tens of millions of deaths, particularly in the 20th century. And their ruthlessness, the way they came to power, the way they amassed power and then controlled their countries with such murderous results is really an important, a important cautionary tale for our time. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I chose to write this book at this time. 
Definitely. Yeah, it's very, it's the kind of thing where it kind of, every once in a while I'd be reading something, it would kind of give me chills and I'm like, whoo, that feels relevant. That feels painfully relevant. <laughs> I'm curious. Make, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to make one, one other point and, and again, and I'll, then I'll let you ask me some questions and, and not just talk so much. But one of the things I want to make clear is that we sometimes talk about these men, these strong men, these authoritarian leaders, these dictators, very ruthless. We call them monsters. And I think it's very important for us to remember that they aren't monsters, they're men. They are human beings. And this story is also about what human beings are capable of doing to other human beings. And we must remember when we get into this long list of the, the atrocities that are committed and the numbers of dead, that those are people. And uh, I remind uh, readers early in the book, uh, if you've been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, it's a rather extraordinary place, of course. I highly recommend it to anyone who visits Washington. It's a grueling experience, but it's worth it. The most memorable thing to me, and I think back of it all the time, is you go through and you see a collection of shoes, the shoes of people who were taken prisoner and ultimately executed in the camps. And seeing these, this massive pile of shoes makes this a human story. Because we can talk about the numbers, but as Stalin himself once said, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. So this is not a book of statistics. It's not an encyclopedia listing of Nazism, fascism, socialism, communism, all the isms. It's really a human story of how men are capable of doing these things to other people. And as I said, a cautionary tale for our time. Definitely. That was kind of one of the things that I thought was incredibly engaging about the book as well, was the fact that you have um, kind of pictures and graphics throughout it. So it isn't just this kind of static reading experience. Like you kind of also get this chance to really break down all of the information and in, in a very digestible way where you don't, you can feel you feel connected to the information, but you don't feel overwhelmed by it. You, like you kind of have an opportunity to digest it a little bit and kind of be able to look at it from different perspectives. And I thought that was really fascinating. Did you always consider that you were gonna kind of throw the pictures and graphics? So is that always gonna be an aspect of the book as you were working on it? Well, this is an interesting shift in my career in a way. And talking about going back to uh, 30 years ago and don't know much about history. It's not a book with any illustrations. Uh, and there were no pictures. And partly it's because the technology of making books has changed. And that's, um, uh, uh, that's a wonderful thing. It's a lot easier to include illustrations in a book today than it was 30 years ago when the uh, printing process was a lot more complex and expensive to do such a thing. So partly it's a, it's a function of the uh, change in technology, which is a, a great thing. Partly it's also the fact that I am writing, uh, to be honest, for a young, younger audience as well as an older audience. I've always believed that my books can be read by young adults and old adults and that they make a great conversation, that we can have a conversation around the dinner table about these subjects. So it's not just, oh, what did you learn in history class today? Oh, we, we learned about Hitler. Oh, well, what'd you learn? Oh, he was a really bad guy. No, this is a way to read this book, maybe in the house, share it back and forth and, uh, and understand it. So there are more illustrations. Uh, it's a shorter book than, than, you know, certainly some of the massive biographies of Stalin or Hitler or Mao that you could find on a, on a shelf. I'm trying to make the, uh, the information accessible and digestible. Um, and, and, uh, the print is, a little bit bigger, uh, the, type, the typeface is bigger and it's a little shorter and there are pictures. And I find that most people like all those things these days. I mean, we have less time to read, to be honest. Um, and it's still important, I think, to get the ideas, to deliver the ideas. And I always say about my books, whether it's this new book, Strongman, or Don't Know Much About History, that 
these books are not the last word on the subject. I believe that they're the first word. And I want people to learn and be curious enough to keep going. And that's why I always offer a lot of source information in my books for where else to look and where else to find out for yourself. To find very important these days, especially talking to younger people, uh, but it's true for everyone. Where do you go to find accurate, ex uh, accessible information that can be relied upon? It's one of the most important things that we can do as citizens in this democracy. Whether you're getting ready to vote for somebody or buy a car, you need accurate, real information, certainly in this moment of pandemic. Yes, and it's yes. that's and incredibly, that's incredibly difficult, difficult to get. get. I think I think right now it's think so, right now, hard so hard with the abundance of information that we receive to be able to kind of parse through and find information that um, feels tangible, which I think is what's great about like reading books is like there's kind of a tangible element to it where it doesn't it doesn't feel I think sometimes the internet can feel a bit ephemeral and like this is a solid book with solid information that is believable and true and you can you can fact check it but it's here. <laughs> well, that, that's, very much that's, appreciate. that's very gratifying to, to hear you say that. So thank you very much. I am a, a, a child of the book. Uh, I grew up, uh, I, I literally remember books in my bed. And uh, so I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to come to Barbara's because to me, bookstores are so essential to, um, to our communities and to our democracy. I, I really do believe that. I was a child, uh, grew up, in a small town just outside of New York City, but there was no bookstore, but we had a wonderful public library. So I was really a child of the public library. I was there at least once a week. And if I didn't get to the library, we had the bookmobile that came around once, uh, once a week. And I remember the day of graduating from the children's room on the downstairs of the public library to go up to the upstairs, the adult room. And it was like walking up this marble, uh, a marble statue in a temple, a Greek temple. So the library and books have been part of my li my entire life. I actually started out before I was a writer, before I knew I could be or would be a writer, I actually worked in a bookstore. Uh, and uh, so it, it, books have really been a part of, uh, of my life. And I believe that books do give us something that's tangible, exactly as you said, that we don't get from the internet. You know, we're living in this age where information is so readily available, but that doesn't really qu qualify how good the information is. So it's really important for us all to be consumers of, of valuable and valid and accurate information. And that's certainly one of the things I try and do in my books. Um, so these these stories are true stories. They are uh, they are not myths uh, ab about these men, and they're horrific stories in many respects. But we need to know them. For sure. How did you go about choosing um, these particular? Because you specifically chose five, and you chose these five. So what was kind of the thought process behind? choosing these particular five dictators? It's a very good and a very fair question. I think that, you know, four of them, certainly uh, the first four, Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, and Chairman Mao are kind of obvious because uh, they are certainly the most murderous dictators of the 20th century whose actions changed the course of world history. And so we must understand them. Now, even though Mussolini was not murderous on the level of a, a Stalin or a Mao in terms of the numbers uh, that are attributed to him, the numbers of dead, uh, Mussolini came first. And that's why I put him first in the book. He established in many ways what I call the strong man's playbook. You look at what Mo Mussolini did in a very short space of time to build a one-party state under his fascist party. And you see the techniques that the others all used. In fact, Hitler certainly followed Mussolini and watched what he had done in Italy and tried to emulate it in some respects. So that's why it was uh, obviously important to include those two, Mussolini and Hitler. They became allies, of course. And Stalin is, uh, of course, the, the centerpiece of, uh, of uh, 
the Soviet Union and the role that communism played and the role that the Cold War played in, in American history. But of course, his story goes back to much earlier than World War II even. Um, he was responsible for millions of deaths before World War II even begins. This is a part of the Stalin story I don't think most people know. Unfortunately, as Americans, you know, we don't get a lot of history in general. We don't do a very good job of, of talking about history and teaching history. We could spend an hour on that subject as well. <laughs> that but is very true. <laughs> we, we get even less world history. So people really have heard the name Stalin and they certainly know the name Hitler. They know the name Mussolini, but they don't really know how these men were able to come to power. And I think that these stories are so instructive that it's, it's really important to know them. Um, Chairman Mao, obviously the uh, leader of, of the Chinese, uh, uh, the People's Republic of China, the leader of the Communist Party in China announced in 1949, he'd, at the end of a long struggle in China, um, and certainly created the beginnings of modern China, which now is, of course, one of the great superpowers of the world. And so you have to examine what he did in shaping this nation, which is so now completely intertwined with our nation. And finally, Saddam Hussein was is probably the, the one that um, might be a little bit um, controversial, not even controversial, but you know why him particularly? Because there were certainly other murderous dictators in the 20th century that I might have included and thought of it about including. Pol Pot of Cambodia, who uh, uh, massacred millions. Uh, Idi Amin of U Uganda. Uh, you can go down a whole list of other really dreadful strongmen, dreadful dictators. But I included Saddam Hussein because the connection between Iraq and the United States in the last 30 years has been so significant in our uh, American foreign policy and in the fact that we went to war twice with this, uh, with this country that I felt that that needed to be the focus, that people should understand how this man was able to come to power in this country and become such a, a, uh, an enemy of the United States that we went to war with him not once but twice. For sure. Um, one of the things I thought was really fascinating was um, some of the commonalities that they had. And one of the things that really stuck out was just kind of how political theater kind of played a role. There was always kind of a sense, and obviously as part of the whole strongman image of like a sense of bravado, a sense of like making making choices that involved and uh, that always involved an audience. Everything that they did kind of had these theatrics to it. And I'm curious how large of a role you think those kind of theatrics play into their rise and whether or not those kind of theatrics are like inherent in democracy or if that's something that's more inherent in their like rise of dictatorship specifically. That's a really, really great question. And I, I could probably spend most of the rest of our next hour <laughs> unpacking that question a little bit. But let, let me start with this, uh, go with a, uh, a specific and an example. And Mussolini being first is the perfect example because you're absolutely right. These men understood theatrics. They understood propaganda, which in a way is connected to theatrics to put on some show, to, to create an image uh, and then promote that image to the people. And they understood as well the importance of the what, what we call the cult of personality, that these men, in essence, become the state. They become the personification of the state. And, and let me start with Mussolini because he did so, these things so clearly, and many people may not be aware of, of Mussolini's rise, that it's a great instruction story. Uh, Mussolini, first of all, I have to point out, this is a surprise to a lot of people, Mussolini was elected in a democracy. He did not come to power in a revolution or a coup. He was a member of the legislature in, Ital uh, in Italy, 
which had a constitutional monarchy, a democracy that had existed since 1860. Um, it was not a very effective government. It was crippled in the post-World War I era, which is very significant in, in, this, in these stories. And um, he was able, through the force partly of his personality, he was a writer and he was a very effective writer, to gather around him a group of men who did not have a particular political ideology, but they knew they wanted to take power in Rome. Mussolini threatens, this is the greatest piece of political theater in the book perhaps, Mussolini threatens that he's going to march on Rome and bring down the government. It's a complete empty threat, a bluff. He has a few people there. They had, they were, some of them had guns, but most of them were carrying sticks and clubs and, uh, and golf clubs and pitchforks. The Italian army could have just wiped them all out. But the king of Italy, who's a rather feckless character, decides instead that rather than allow Mussolini to go through with this threat, he's going to offer to him to become the prime minister of Italy. So Mussolini, instead of riding into Rome at the head of an army like Julius Caesar, arrives on the sleeper car overnight from Milan and is made prime minister. And he stands on the balcony of the uh, of the a palace in Rome as the men who were supposed to march on Rome then parade through the streets and the people cheer because the king has just announced that this man is going to be the savior of Italy. In a very, very short space of time, Mussolini and his fascist party create a one-party state. They make other parties illegal. They crush any opposition newspapers. They start to demand loyalty oaths. So all of the techniques that we think of as the strong man, Mussolini knew them, whether instinctively or otherwise, he knew them and he used them. He also used ruthless brutality and violence as well as using legal means. So there's an election called almost immediate, immediately after he's made prime minister. And it's a, an election that's clearly riddled by violence, fraud and corruption across Italy. A senator in the uh, Italian Senate gets up and talks about this, how corrupt this election has been. Well, the next day he disappears, he's kidnapped, and a few weeks later his body is found. So this was the, the thuggish, violent part of the Mussolini fascism that he didn't show to the people. Instead, he showed him this, them this great leader and cr created himself as the, in the image of the face of Italy, and he was going to modernize Italy and bring it forward and put Italy on the map with the other great powers of, of Europe. Let me just add four, uh, a quick four points here about how he did this and how these others do it. First of all, intense, powerful nationalism and populism. We have to make the nation great. We have to restore the greatness of the past and I am the, the man of the people who will do this. Uh, to do that, you point to an enemy, real or an imagined enemy. So in Italy's case, they said the communists are destroying the country or the foreigners and the banks that, that uh, treated us uh, badly after the war. These are the people who are responsible for the bad situation here. Next, you talk about corruption and bringing to, into play the law and order that the country needs. So these are all very, very uh, familiar sounding things to a lot of people, I'm sure. And uh, finally, you create uh, or exaggerate a sense of crisis. And Italy was clearly in a crisis in, in the 1920s, uh, a very desperately poverty-stricken poverty nation that had uh, lost many men during World War I. They fought on the winning side, but really didn't reap any of the rewards, the spoils of victory that fed into the disillusionment and anger of, the, of, of the, the sense of grievance that Mussolini played on. So all of these things factor into his rise to power. And then he quickly moves once he is in power to establish his party as a single party state and demand loyalty. And that was done through violence, demanding uh, uh, loyalty from professors, from the press, from people in the scientific field. And this is the way a strong man 
consolidate his power. Of course, he has a lot of willing accomplices, and we have to speak to that point as well. Mussolini doesn't do this by himself. There are willing generals, willing other willing politicians. In Mussolini's case, religious leaders, the Vatican supported what he was doing because they feared communism, and Mussolini was going to get rid of the communists. So all of these factors play into his role, but he understood theater, and he understood propaganda, and he understood the control of the press. And he did those three things very quickly to cement his control on the country. Yeah, I feel like I, I would imagine there are many people who feel a lot of resonance with what you just said, I would imagine. And I wonder I, about, uh, oh yes. Let me make one quick comment yes, about that. Yes, of course, please. Okay. <laughs> Nowhere in this book do I mention any current political politicians or leaders of any kind. That being said, <laughs> I do think that the lessons that I'm talking about do resonate in our time. And that's why I think when I'm talking about the threats to democracy, and I'm talking about the threats to the democracy in the United States, I'm being, I'm, I'm, I'm being very, very honest, and I'm being... Um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm probably more pessimistic than I've been at any time in my life of observing politics in America, partly because I know this story and I've seen what happens. Democracy does not die in darkness. I love the Washington Post. I read it every day online. But that motto is inaccurate. Mussolini came to power in broad daylight. Democracy died in Italy while the sun was shining and thousands of people cheered. And that's what we have to remember. This isn't some secret uh, cabal that does this in the, in the darkness of the night. It's often done in broad daylight. Well, and that's, that's something that I actually, I find really fascinating because I think while we're having this conversation about the things that these strong men did, I wonder so much about kind of the, peop the people themselves and how the people kind of fall under their spell. And like, what is the, what is the climate that fosters those theatrics and makes it easy for people to fall under the spell of what these men have done? It's a really, another really great question. Um, certainly in almost every one of these countries that I talk about, the circumstances, social, political, economic, financial, diplomatic, were grim. And these men are able to take advantage of what is a grim situation, terrible unemployment, uh, perhaps in, in, in Italy's case, having won, uh, been on the winning side of one war, but feeling like they got cheated out of it. Uh, in Germany's case, and we haven't talked about Hitler at all yet, the, the feeling of degradation and uh, humiliation that Germans felt after the defeat in World War I was something Hitler himself felt very, very deeply personally, but he was then able to play on that with the people. So one thing I would say uh, is that these men are not bringing ideas to these people that are brand new or bringing feelings to them that they don't have. I think that they are able to amplify and magnify what people might be feeling and give a voice to it. That's certainly what Hitler does. There was certainly anti-Semitism in Germany for centuries, long before Hitler came along. He played on that essential streak of anti-Semitism that goes back for centuries in Germany and the rest of Europe. Uh, it's part of the original sin of Christianity in a way that, that uh, Europe's Jews were, were accused of being Christ killers and there was tremendous resentment for them, tremendous propaganda. Of course, along comes uh, the protocols of the elders of Zion. Propaganda created in Tsarist Russia that starts to spread around Europe. I should also mention before it spread to Europe, it was actually published in the United States by Henry Ford. Henry Ford, the famous uh, man who started the Ford Motor Company, published the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in his newspaper, which was not only a local newspaper, it was in every Ford dealership in America. 
And so that's part of this story as well. Um, that's, that's super fascinating, that reach, just like the, the ability to get that kind of reach through something as simple as a businessman who has the ability to reach a wide range using his business in a way. And aren't we seeing that today? <laughs> no names here, but yes, uh, you know, there, are, there, are, there are powerful businessmen, whether they are in the social media or the more traditional media, print and television and, and publishing, uh, who have tremendous control over the, the flow of ideas. And um, even though we'd like to believe we're in this information society and there's a lot of free information flowing, it's still uh, in, the con in the control of uh, a few hands in many respects. And I'm not, you know, a crazy radical here, so I don't, I don't want to give that impression, but I, I do think that these are pressing uh, concerns for a modern democracy where the free flow of information is so important, particularly in an age that we call the information age. No, for sure. And I, I wonder a lot about how, um, like, trying to figure out how to explain it, because I have basically my thing is we have so many people we can talk about. And so I'm trying to keep things general so that we have a chance to get to the amazing questions that people have. So I'm trying to like word this in a way that it can apply to a couple of different people. <laughs> um, I wonder a lot about kind of the fact that there's this this idea of kind of latching on to a concept. So like, if you think about kind of Stalin's philosophies of might makes right and the ends justify the means. And I think like one of the things I think was always kind of a through line was this latching onto like a simple concept. And I wonder about, is it, do you think that that was something that drove their visions in a way or kind of allowed them to kind of pinpoint everything to make it easily digestible for people? Uh, yes, I think that they all had very simple messages and I'm not sure in all of these cases if it's uh, if we can blanket say they all had their own particular ideology. I think that for these five men, like most strong men through history, the point of power, as George Orwell wrote in 1984, the point of power is power. The point of torture is torture. The point of a dictatorship is a dictatorship. Um, th that's what these men essentially are interested in. Uh, I don't believe, for instance, that Mussolini started out his life as a young man as a socialist and you know completely moved away from that. I don't think that he was driven by a particular political philosophy other than the st the state is me and I am the state and what I what I say goes and that's that was the essence of of what he wanted to do. Did he want to make Italy into a, an empire on the the scale of Great Britain or France uh, with with their holdings around the world? Yes, he did, and he certainly the first one of the first things he does is go to war uh, because that's another thing these strong men like to do, go to war, it unites the country, it makes them feel powerful, especially if you go to war against a very weak uh, uh, opponent as Mussolini did against first Libya and then Abyssinia, what we call Ethiopia today. So that, that's part of the, the strong man's playbook as well. Hitler certainly had uh, more ideology uh, at work, but his ideology was also one in which the centerpiece was making Germany, once again, the great nation it had been, and expanding into the rest of Europe to make room for Germans to take over. And even if that meant eliminating the people that he thought of as subhuman, he thought the Germans were the master race. And if it meant getting rid of the Eastern Europeans, the Slavs, so that the Germans could have room to live, he was willing to do that. Um, so that was his driving force, fed by his anti-Semitism, of course, and his really virulent anti-communism. Um, Stalin is, at first, as a young man, is a Marxist, a true believer of Marx and a follower of Lenin. Uh, he begins his career as a bank robber. Uh, I described that in the very first, uh, the 
opening scene of the the chapter about Stalin. Which that is was called, so surprising to me. The chapter called Man that of was so Steel. incredibly surprising. It's like a bank robbery out of the, you know the old west, Jesse James. But this is Stalin and his thuggish men are robbing a bank of the czar to fund the Russian Revolution, uh, and this is how he he begins. And certainly, then he works his way up through the ranks of the Communist Party, the Politburo. Um, very, very skillful, very, very ruthless at, at bringing loyalists in around him and getting rid of people who he does not believe are his allies. Um, ultimately, that leads to his uh, getting rid of Trotsky. This is long after Lenin's death. Trotsky goes to Mexico, where he's eventually executed uh, by uh, Stalin's agents. So this is a man whose uh, who's real goal, uh, apart from being a true believer in Marxist Lenin's communism was to make the Soviet Union a modern industrial empire, emperor, empire on uh, the same ranks as the United States and Great Britain. And he was willing to sacrifice many, many lives to reach that goal uh, to, and, and remarkably does it in, in, in many respects, although the, the system ultimately, uh, as we know, dies of its own uh, of its own weight. Um, Mao is certainly also a true believer when he starts out, uh, a, a true believer in the communist ideal, workers of the world unite. Uh, and he got the, the peasantry to join him because he said, we must make China great again. And we'll do that by getting rid of these uh, landholders and the, the farmers who have been keeping you down and oppressing you. Um, and so very, very brutally, ruthlessly, uh, there's the collectivization in China that leads to millions of deaths by camps, extermination, starvation, uh, the, the purges that, that happen later on. Um, so, but again, you have to look at this as a man who wants to concentrate power and is really willing to do almost anything to do that and finds willing accomplices to go along with him. Yes. Uh, it's all so powerful. <laughs> like there's just so much, to, there's so many layers to every, to like all of these men and all the different things, the different tactics and the, um, the ideologies and there's commonalities amongst them, but there's also so many differences. Yeah, no, they're, they're, that's why it's, it's I, I would never try and reduce them to simplistic ideas. And it's not like saying, oh, well, when his when he was young, his father beat him up. And so did his father. And so does his father. So, you know, the problem with that is uh, that every little boy who was beaten by his father became a murderous dictator. The world would be filled with many more murderous dictators. So, you know, I don't go for simplistic explanations like that, but I do want to explain the human side. It's told, typical boys of his age in China, that he was gonna marry a girl who's um, much older than him and he refuses. It's pretty striking that a Chinese boy would do such a thing. He actually refuses to go into this arranged marriage, even though it it was official. He was officially married to this woman, but he, he never lived with her. And then he really kind of goes off on his own. So all of them were in some respects, Saddam Hussein is the, uh, is the outlier here, were boys who balked at the world and the ideas that their fathers held out for them. Hitler's father wanted him to go to school, get a nice job in the civil service. He was a civil servant himself. Hitler uh, really saw himself as an aspiring uh, artist and painter, and that's what he wanted to do. And after his father's death, um, he uh, moves to Vienna to try and become an art, uh, an art student, ends up homeless in Vienna, selling postcards uh, of his paintings of Vienna. Um, what an extraordinary piece of that chapter of his life that most people have never heard. For sure. I think we are at a point where we should start digging into these audience questions. Oh, please. I'm well, I'm looking forward to them. 
So, all right. So our first question is from Amy and she wonders, how many of the foreign sites of these dictators have you visited? How many of the foreign sites have I visited? That's a very good and fair question. And actually, in throughout my my work as a writer, I've always tried to go to the places I've visited. In this case, with the exception of Italy, Mussolini's Italy, I've never been to any of the other um, four countries. I've never been to uh, Germany. I've never been to Russia or the Soviet Union, China or Iraq. So um, this truly was the uh, old fashioned kind of dig through the archives type of research as opposed to going to those places. It's a very good question because as a writer, I really like to go um, and, and see and smell and feel the places that I'm writing about. But in this case, it was um, because of the difficulties at the time, it was not possible. Was there any particular um, like fascinating artifacts or libraries or anywhere that you went while doing your research? Well, I think the probably the most fascinating thing that I saw that wasn't even specifically research, I knew it existed and I wanted to see it with my own eyes, is the Milan Central train station in Milan, Italy. It was built by Mussolini. And it is one of the real true last vestiges in a way of the fascist era, because a lot of, uh, of what was built uh, was destroyed during the war, but the Milan train sa station survives. And when you see it, it's this epic monumental building like a great Greek temple or great Roman temple to be more precise with figures, horses and men at the top and all around the, the outside on the facade, the symbol of the fascis. And it might be a good point to explain what that means. Mussolini took a symbol from ancient Rome. He wanted to bring back the glory of ancient Rome. So he took the symbol of ancient Rome, which was the uh, uh, rods bound together with an ax head in the center. And this was something that a magistrate or tribunal carried in ancient Rome as a sign of authority, power, uh, and, and leadership. So he took this ancient Roman symbol and made it the symbol of his party, the fascist party. That's where the word comes from, an ancient Roman symbol. Uh, which, so you go and see it in modern day Italy, and there are these fasces on the side, and you can still see symbols also. Mussolini used to have his picture on walls all over the place, on private homes. So that's a vestige that you still see of this era, which is interesting. One doesn't go, for instance, and see too many things that are left um, that Hitler built, you know, and you don't see images of Hitler in Germany, for instance. So I, I thought that was a particularly interesting vestige. One other, uh, this is actually true, Mussolini, Stalin, and Mao all have grave sites that are visited people make pilgr pilgrimage to them. And Mao is in, uh, in fact, is, is one of the most significant tourist sites in Beijing. And I don't know what it's like in the COVID era, but it used to be that people lined up for a mile or so to be able to go in, walk past uh, the, the body of Chairman Mao just for a few seconds. So to me, that's a fascinating thing, not only because it exists, but that this man is still venerated in a country in which he is known to have killed 40 to 50 million people over the course of, of his lifetime. So that's, uh, to me, a rather extraordinary modern uh, place that one could see that speaks to the, the, the power of these men and the power of mythology that lives on after them. Yeah, I was gonna actually ask about that. Was it um, the, why do you think that Mao is so venerated? Like, do you have any kind of theories as to why? I write about it actually in the, in the chapter and, and offer an explanation mm -hmm. that uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party still sees Mao as the great helmsman, the father of the country who built this, this, this country from this, the poverty and the, the corruption of the last empire uh, which ended of, or just around the beginning of the 20th century, of course, and built it into a modern superpower. 
So he's, he's venerated for that while they are able to set aside or sweep under the rug the painful truth of, of the reality of, of how murderous his regime was. So the, 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 the modern Chinese Communist Party is still built on the ideal of this, this great uh, figure who created modern China and these men are now just taking it forward from them, the, the, the current uh, uh, party leadership in, in China. Um, which is, of course, we should point out, uh, certainly not murderous on the level of, of Mao, but it's still one of the most ruthless, repressive uh, regimes in the world today and uh, responsible for you know, indoctrinating and, and putting people into the so-called education camps that are uh, essentially concentration camps as a very, very visible symbol that this kind of power this kind of ruthlessness exists in our world today and we can see it in putin and we can see it in a handful more than a handful of other leaders around the world that's why this whole sense of authoritarianism on the rise in, this, in the world right now is so troubling and so worrisome to me and many other people for sure so uh our next question i actually we have two questions that are kind of like somewhat related to each other, I think. So I'm going to kind of ask both of them together and then you could kind of parse it out a bit. Um, so we have Kristen who asks, do you see any correlation between any of these dictators and the way the government is going in the USA today? And what should we be watching for? And then Sheila asks, did Trump's presidency impact the writing of your book in terms of him moving to being an autocratic leader or in your word, a strong man? So I kind of think these, both of these questions can kind of be answered yes. together and, somewhat. And I, and I don't want to duck them at all, even though, again, I, I will say that uh, I do not mention any current political leaders in this book, partly because I think the lessons in this book will go on long after the current political situation in this country. And I do hope it resolves that the system that we have had for 230 odd years will continue and be restored to full vigor. Um, certainly I see that uh, it, it's not so much that I was watching what was going on and that was influencing what I was writing so much as I, I was writing about these men and seeing some of the same things happen. So it's kind of a, a little bit of a flip of the question. Certainly if I talk about these four things that I, that I mentioned earlier on, the intense nationalism uh, that calls for restoring a, a country's greatness. Well, look, the man ran on make America great again. I, I, I'm not making that up. Placing blame on a single group. Um, you, you, I'll, I'll put that out there and you can you know, think for yourselves. Warning of an emergency often non-existent or responding to severe economic distress that threatens the nation, sometimes created. So uh, coming in and saying the, the country is a catastrophe, the economics are a catastrophe. I'm a businessman, I'm going to fix that. Uh, finally, calls for law and order and eliminating corruption. Well, drain the swamp, law and order. So these are the messages of the traditional strongman for winning support and coming into power. This, has Donald Trump used all four of those? I would say so. So he's four for four on that. Uh, then I go on from once in power, these men do a whole series of things. Uh, attack the press. Well, I, again, I'm, I won't say it. I'm just going to tell you what these men do historically. Attack the press. Attack the election system. Attack, uh, uh, use propaganda. Propaganda is very powerful. Attack political opponents with the means of government. We have now had the President of the United States and I, again, this is, uh, if I, I can't believe sometimes the things that I read on the front page of the New York Times, 
the president of the United States has refused to acknowledge that the outcome of the election might be uh, acceptable to him. Uh, he's threatened his uh, opponent and former opponent and predecessor with jail. Oh, these are the techniques of the strongman. Um, I am not saying this glibly. I, I, that's why I, I do think it's a, a, a moment of high concern. Um, talking about um, the uh, the use of propaganda and, and and the use of the big lie. Um, this is a president who we has, has documented um, many, many lies. So um, without sounding too partisan here, because I, tr I do try and have the objectivity of a historian as I say this, these are all the things that certainly I I looked at these men while I'm writing this book and seeing this going on in this country today. And yes, it's very, um, it makes me somewhat pessimistic and somewhat alarmed because you then have to come get, get to the point of what do I do about it? Um, and traditionally, and certainly in this book, there are three responses for the most part. You can be a collaborator, you go along with it. You can be a bystander sort of, well, it's not affecting me, so I'll just go about my life and not worry about it. Or you can be an upstander. Uh, unfortunately, most of the upstanders in, in these uh, stories do not come to a happy ending. Certainly when I write about, for instance, the White Rose Movement, these teenage students who challenged Nazism, and most of them were, all of them were executed. Um, that takes extraordinary courage. So to be an upstander, to stand up to a Stalin, to stand up to a Mussolini, like that senator stood up in the Italian Senate and spoke about the corruption and violence of the fascist, and he's disappeared the next day. Um, this is certainly the part of the fear that, um, that helps these men stay in power. Yes. Yeah, I think, and that was actually kind of leading into my next question, which was kind of, cause we're right at basically the end of our event. And I just want to keep talking cause this is all so incredibly fascinating. Um, but do any parting words on things maybe that we can do or things that we can think about as we are contextualizing this book and considering like what we can do to prevent this from happening again? It's, it's a really important question. And first of all, uh, since we're near the end, I want to just thank you for this opportunity. And I'm sorry I don't get to see everyone who's there. And, uh, you know, I hope we'll, the day will come when I come back and visit and we can do this live. But the most important thing, obviously, well, two things. And I'm going to get a prop. <laughs> Yes. Yep. Most wear, your important mask, thing. wear your mask, first of all, and vote. But beyond yes. voting, beyond voting, you have a voice. And that's an extraordinary thing in this country. Because one of the things I've always written about in my books, going back to don't know much about history, is that how much of the change in this country has not come from the top down, but the bottom up. And it's often come from people who don't have a vote but do have a voice, whether it was abolition, suffrage, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, uh, which you know I was certainly involved in as a teenager. These were all issues that people who went out and marched and spoke and protested and didn't go to school as I did, uh, didn't go. Um, that's your voice. And that's as important, if not more important sometimes than, than your vote. So both things together. Um, certainly going and voting is issue number one. If you really believe that this is a democracy worth saving, you have to make your voice heard first through your vote and then through all of the other ways that we can do that. And um, we are fortunate that this country has not fallen prey to a strong man yet partly because I think we have systems and institutions and a belief in the fundamental rightness of the system that allows people to use those voices. So again, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.
Yes, of course. Thank you so much. This has been so informative and just really lovely to kind of talk about these dark, dark things, but in a way that hopefully we can all kind of walk away understanding a little bit more and knowing the kind of action that we can take to move forward. Democracy yeah. is not a spectator sport. It definitely isn't. Thank all right, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. Please make sure to pick up this incredible book. It's so wonderful and just so helpful. Ooh, actually, Laura Castro just asked if this is being taped. So actually, it is being taped. It is permanently recorded on this web page. So all you have to do is come back to the original link and it will live here forever where you can access it and watch it whenever you'd like. And please share it with anyone that you think should watch this video and get a better understanding of where we're at, where we've been and how we can move forward. So definitely pick up this book. You can use the green button at the bottom of your screen that says Get Strong Man Now. Please make sure that when you do, you, um, put events at checkout in order to get a 10% off discount. Um, we are always hosting really, really wonderful events. We have some incredible ones coming up through the rest of this month. Um, over the next few days, over this weekend, we actually have an in-person discussion with US intelligence analyst, Bill Rapp. Um, he'll be at our Burr Ridge location on Saturday at 1 p.m. And he'll be at our Vernon Hills location Sunday at 2 p.m. Um, you can get all the information at our website. Um, also, please make sure to keep an eye out for our new book club, in super inclusive book club, which is called Culture Exposure, where we um, read books written by a wide range of marginalized voices. And then we have discussions about those books as well as those marginalizations. Super informative, so important to have these conversations. Um, our next one is October 28th, which is, we do it every last Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m. This month, it features the book, The City We became by N.K. Jemison. All righty. Well, once again, thank you so, so much for being here, Ken. I really, really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And uh, people who are interested to learn a little bit more about me can go to my website, which is don'tknowmuch.com and find out more about my books there. Yes, please do. All right, everyone. Thank Happy you. reading. Thanks again. Good night, all. Be safe. Yes, be safe.